Great. Um, so I'm just going to go down the row here. Uh, Nicole, who we heard from earlier, Nicole Hannah-Jones covers racial injustice for the New York Times Magazine, and she has spent many years chronicling the way official policy has created and works to maintain segregation in housing and schooling. She's written extensively on the history of racism and inequality, school resegregation, and the disarray of hundreds of desegregation orders, the decades-long failure of the federal government to enforce the landmark 1968 Fair Housing Act. She's also written one of the most widely read analyses of racial implications of the controversial Fisher versus University of Texas Affirmative Action Supreme Court case. Hannah Jones was named the Journalist of the Year by the National Association of Black Journalists and was named to the Route 100. Her rep reporting has won Deadline Club Awards, Online Journalism Awards, the Sigma Delta Chi Award for Public Service, the Fred M. Hetchinger Award for Distinguished Education Reporting, the Emerson, Emerson College President's Award for Civic Leadership, and she was a finalist for the National Magazine Award. Just last month, she won the George Polk Award for Radio Reporting for a July 2015 episode of This American Life. The episode was called The Problem We All Live With, and it focused on resegregation of public schooling in the United States, and in particular, the public school district attended by Michael Brown, the African-American man whose death in a 2014 police shooting in Ferguson, Missouri, sparked the Black Lives Matter movement. Hannah Jones holds a Master of Arts in Mass Communication from the University of North Carolina, and she earned a Bachelor in History and African-American Studies from the University of, of Notre Dame. Lisa Gartner is an education reporter for the Tampa Bay Times, and that was formerly known as the St. Petersburg Times. Her most recent project, Failure Fract Factories, was a year-long investigation into how local school boards abandoned integration and neglected five elementary schools in South Pinellas County, and they became the worst schools in Florida. The series is the 2016 winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Local Reporting, the George Polk Award for Education Reporting, the Worth Bingham Prize for Investigative Journalism, and the Investigative Reporters and Editors Medal, among other honors. Gartner covered DC public schools, the Washington Examiner, before joining the Times in 2013 to cover the Pinellas schools. Her beat coverage of Pinellas was named among the best in the nation by the Education Writers Association in 2014. Gartner is a graduate of Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism. Sue Robinson is an associate professor here at UW-Madison. She's on the faculty in the School of Journalism and Mass Communications. As a scholar, she explores how journalism and news organizations adopt new information communication technologies to report on public affairs in new forms and formats, as well as how audiences and individuals can use technologies for civic engagement. Central to her work is the consideration of how information flow and how it flows and moves through specific media ecologies and networks at the local community level. Her current multi-phased, multi-method book project, Net Networked Voices, Race, Journalism, and Progressive Politics, studies how digital platforms enable and constrain citizens, especially those in marginalized communities, who produce and share information in the public sphere about racial achievement in the K-12 education system. Sue Robinson was one of the recipients of the Meyer Faculty Development Endowment Award and the AEJMC Krybong Under 40 Award for her scholarship on newsrooms, information authority, and digital technologies. She's currently working with journalists across the country through the nonpartisan Kettering Foundation as well as school super superintendents across the country through the Minority St Student Achievement Network on how to better facilitate conversations about race. So with no further ado, I will begin to ask a couple of questions of the panelists and then we will, of course, turn over to all of you so that you can ask some questions of these really, really skilled people that we have for you today. So I'd like to give a chance for each of the panelists to speak to um, a recent project on race and education um, and the findings of that work so that we can begin to place this in, in terms of their, their current work that they're working on. So let's start with you, Nicole. Um, I, I guess I'll talk briefly about um, a project that published 
couple years ago called Segregation Now. And it was a project that was investigating how our schools have come, become resegregated. When I started that project in 2013, uh, I would wake up in cold sweats because I was spending a year on a project about something that America had decided was no longer of interest, which was school segregation. Mm -hmm. um, I set up Google Alerts at the time when I first started reporting for the word school segregation, school integration, and I would get maybe a Google alert every couple of weeks or so, uh, that has changed. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely, um, I, I, I worried that I was gonna spend this much time on something and my editors would never let me spend this much time on a project again because no one would read it and no one would care. And most of the things I write about, I don't expect that anything will change and I certainly didn't expect that we would now be having conversations on school segregation that we're having now. Um, but I decided to do it because I, I believe that we must write about things that we don't think will change, that we must write and report on um, the issues that are most deeply entrenched. And I had seen a lot of reports saying that schools were resegregating. It wasn't news, but I wanted to show how and why they were resegregating and that this wasn't some natural phenomenon, some accidental phenomenon, but that actually um, officials were making decisions that were leading to that resegregation and were following up that resegregation by systematically depriving these resegregated schools of equal resources. Mm -hmm. So I ended up telling the story through Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and I told the story in the South because the South actually made the most progress when it came to integration, which is contrary to popular belief, the worst segregation is in the North. It's been in the North for more than 60 years. Mm -hmm. And because of federal court orders mandating integration in the South, the South actually is the most integrated part of the country. Mm -hmm. And I started to look at what was happening once school districts were relieved of their federal court orders requiring integration. And what you saw mm -hmm. is that as soon as school districts were no longer required to do things to integrate, they immediately took actions to segregate. Mm -hmm. So they didn't just yeah. stop, they actually did things that led to resegregation, like redrawing attendance zone lines in ways that segregated schools, opening new schools in very segregated areas. Um, and so my reporting was, was to show the way that people actually sat in rooms and decided to resegregate black children particularly and sometimes Latino children, and then uh, deprive those, those students of equal educational opportunities. So that's the most recent project that I did. And since then, luckily we, we have begun to see a really a wave of reporting on school segregation. And for the first time in 30 years, the US Department of Education is actually talking about integration again, which is pretty amazing. Mm. Lisa, we'll go to you next, a recent project that you've been working on. Um, uh, well, I'll talk about failure factories. Um, we say it was a year-long project. It was uh, actually closer to two years at this point because we're still covering the, uh, the fallout from it and we want to uh, make sure we're still holding the people in power accountable, that um, their reactions to uh, our stories are not just going to fall by the wayside, as I'm sure they would love for it to. Um, we didn't start off, well, first of all, Failure Factories examines five elementary schools in um, South Pinellas County, uh, which is in the Tampa Bay area of Florida. Um, it talks about how they be, were transformed from uh, fairly average elementary schools, um, one of them was even an A-rated school, into five of the worst 15 schools in the state. Um, we didn't start off uh, looking to write about um, segregation or the um, abandonment of integration, but that's where our reporting led us. Um, and essentially what happened, um, as she just spoke to, is that when Pinellas was released from a court order in 2007, mm -hmm. um, they, they uh, essentially resegregated these schools and they, and they promised to deliver a lot of resources because um, they knew exactly what was going to happen and, and they've said that publicly. Uh, and, and then they just didn't, uh, we found through our reporting, they didn't uh, you know, deliver the teacher incentives that they talked about, build up the programs they said would draw families. They, in many cases, did not put the extra money that they were supposed to into these schools. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where, uh, that's how we came upon that. Um, and, and our series is five parts. It talks about uh, sort of how this problem came to be over time. It talks about uh, discipline issues in the schools, um, mm -hmm. behavior management techniques that were abandoned, um, teachers, um, more than 100 teachers with uh, 10 years or more experience fled the schools very quickly after these changes were made. 
uh, so that it was almost all rookies and teachers with checkered pasts teaching there. Um, and uh, we talked about how black children were being denied access to some of the best schools in the district as well. And uh, it, it, was a, it was a strange story to do in the sense that uh, we had not discovered the problem. This was something that uh, the black community in St. Petersburg had been saying for a long time, but they weren't being heard um, or believed, which was a shame. And uh, we've been tracking the impact. Currently, the US Department of Education is uh, conducting a civil rights investigation into the school district to um, sense the extent of the discrimination against black children there. Sue, a recent project that you've been working on? Yeah, sure. I'll talk about my book, uh, which is, again, Networked Voices, uh, Race, Journalism, and Progressive Politics. I'm just finishing it up now. Um, so five years ago, the Urban League here in Madison had proposed a charter school um, to educate um, kids, of youth, youth of color, as a way to help solve some of the very terrible achievement disparities that were present here in the K-12 school system and, and still are present here, actually. So the Urban League school didn't pass, but I was really interested um, in the really vitriolic dialogue that was happening in this community. And so I started taking a look at it, and I was really curious because Madison is so progressive, um, and why, why we were having um, such problems talking about race. So I was a, you know, I'm very white, and I'm also very um, progressive and liberal myself. So I had to find um, my own sort of biases as, as I went through talking to people um, in, the, in this community. And then I also expanded it to uh, four other communities across the nation that were also highly liberal, all connected to universities, all with really terrible achievement disparities um, between their white students and, and um, students of color. So in all, um, we looked at about 4,000 pieces of content, press releases, news articles, blogs, Facebook posts, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then we talked to more than 120 um, people. And most of these people uh, were both school officials, journalists, um, bloggers, activists, um, youth activists and civil rights activists and other kinds of activists, as well as um, the progressives that were running these towns, as well as um, parents and um, some 18-year-old uh, high school students as well. And what, what we found was that there were intense conversations happening in all these dialogues. These are all, you know, it was like Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and Evanston, Illinois. And, and they were um, crazy conversations, but they were happening in silos. That is, they were happening um, with uh, most all white journalists in all these towns mm -hmm. talking to mostly white um, politicians and activists um, and uh, parents and teachers mm -hmm. and with a few exceptions their stories were mostly based off of the school hearings um, or a report that would come out from testing for example and meanwhile we had all of these white progressive bloggers that were also highly active in these communities engaging in heated exchanges on Facebook and um, on news sites with those who are supporting the schools. And then we also had all of these sort of um, activists of color that were engaging in all of the communities, including their own, but they ended up being more punctuation points in the dialogue as opposed to bridges within to these communities, um, particularly in communities that had really divergent opinions about school performance and what was happening. So I, I look at this as sort of entrenched identity constructs that were happening. When people who are highly liberal feeling their public schools are being attacked, they're feeling that they themselves are attacked and that their, um, their life's work is being attacked, right? Particularly when you're talking to teachers and, and school officials. And so they'll argue that the disparities are about poverty, right? Mm -hmm. um, which really serves to absolve the schools of any responsibility. And so in the book, I kind of make up all these suggestions after talking to all these people and doing all this analysis. And, and some of those um, suggestions were um, really kind of a recommitment to sort of the watchdog function of journalism, a recommitment to understanding communities from within communities and thinking about yourself as a reporter um, as a citizen within those communities, as somebody who is authentically a member of those communities and, and what would that look like in terms of reporting. And so part of the solutions I, I talk about is moving beyond um, this sort of two hour a year diversity training that a lot of these newsrooms have um, and doing real self introspection as a journalist about their own biases and privileges and kind of really having that training um, in a real intense way and having that inform your reporting as you go through. 
And then also reconsidering the reporter deadlines and the reporter routines that have been um, developed over time, in part because of resources, right, and in part because of, of real existing pressures, but trying to re um, manipu trying to manipulate those in such a way that recommits to um, the communities themselves. Uh, so I found one of the things is that the main influence of the reporters was the school districts. So the officials and the superintendents and the press releases that come out of those offices. And so when that happens, um, what you end up having is the default protagonist being the very people who are responsible for these disparities, right? And so all that does is sort of reify that status quo. And it doesn't allow in our reporting for that watchdog function of questioning um, what the structures are in place that have created these policies to begin with. So we begin having a conversation that moves us forward and actually starts resolving some of these problems. So we also took a look at what was working in these cities and there were a lot of things um, that were working. In particular, I noted the Cap Times, the Capital Times here in Madison who have um, really taken the lead in trying to co-sponsor forums in the community and even funding local movements. Um, I look at the M Live reporters over at Ann Arbor, Michigan who were in the commenting sessions and really trying to mitigate some of that vitriol and trying to moderate those discussions in a way that was productive as opposed to you know, just sort of a cesspool. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and really just you know, trying to come up with all these um, ideas about social media networks and trying to recapture the power of social media works and, and, and reaching into communities and amplifying voices that were not heard in the mainstream articles that I looked at here. Um, and so that's pretty much um, all I wanted to talk about with the book in terms of um, just trying to empower journalists to have agency themselves, um, enabling, to, to enabling all citizens to have a voice. And so I really just a would call for a recommitment to the fundamental role that journalism is all about, which is um, in a working democracy. So that leads nicely to a, um, a question I'd like to ask about, about ethics so that um, we're linking to the, to the conference today too um, in, in the terms of the ethics and journalism reporting. So what are the ethics about the topics that are covered relative to racial disparities in education? So for example, what are ethical issues in choosing to either cover or not cover continued school segregation um, and racial disparities in education? And Nicole, we'll start with you again. Okay. I mean, if you heard the keynote, I think mm -hmm. the ethical mm -hmm. implication is an ethical failure. Mm -hmm. um, if I don't understand how one can write about education and not write about segregation if one actually is looking at the data and the research on this. And I think it, it has shown our lack of paying attention to the effects of segregation, even as we are looking at every measure of school quality through a racial lens. I mean, that's what No Child Left Behind does, is it takes every student and slices them up into various characteristics, including, including race, and then judges those students and those schools based on those things. Mm -hmm. um, that we are doing that and not looking at what we know is a clear problem, I think has been a failure. And a failure of basic reporting, one of the things that has been my gospel over the last three years is to simply do reporting and test it out. If um, if we are saying that this segregation in and of itself is not harmful, that which is over the last 30 years what we've come to embrace, whether you are liberal, whether you are conservative, whether you are in the North or the South, is that this time we actually can make separate equal, that um, segregation was only a problem when it was mandated by law, that segregation in fact is not a problem, and so black kids don't need to be in white schools or with white kids to get an equal education. We just have to give them the resources. So then we test that theory out. Right. Have we given them the resources? So mm -hmm. I ask, have you looked at school attendance zone maps in your district and seen how they are drawn? Mm -hmm. Of course, if you do, you'd be surprised to find that they are just as gerrymandered as election districts and that segregation is created intentionally on school maps. Absolutely. Then I say, have you looked at the teacher credentials at heavily black and Latino schools? Are we getting the same quality of teachers in those schools? And if so, if not, why not? And the answer is no. Look at the data coming out of the U.S. Department of Education that shows the more black and Latino a school is, the less likely that school is to have a qualified credential teacher. 
Look at the courses. Are heavily black and Latino schools getting the same courses as heavily white schools? Again, across the board, the answer is no. So these are easily, like, you don't have to get into emotion. You don't have to prove intent. You don't have to find who's racist and who's not. You can actually just look at verifiable data and see that we have not for one day in this country followed through on that promise of making separate equal. So why haven't we? And then it becomes an excuse, which is um, kind of what you're pointing out with your research, where then the very people who are charged with providing this equal education blame the students in the school. They blame the population in the school for not providing these things. So what have I heard? We don't have the best qualified teachers because it's really hard to get veteran teachers in high poverty failing schools. Mm -hmm. Well, of course. That's why we should not have high poverty segregated schools. They'll say we can't offer physics at this high school because this is a very poor black school and there's not enough kids who want physics. So that's why we don't offer physics. Lo and behold, in Tuscaloosa, when they finally were forced to offer physics, kids took physics. Mm -hmm. um, they will blame all of the things on the structure of the school that they have created, and then we allow them as journalists to do that. So I think that we have not been doing our jobs, and we have also come to believe that we can make separate schools equal. If that's true, then show me where it's happened. If it's not as journalists, our job is to point that out and to apply pressure, and I think we've been failing for a long time. I think we've been failing because I don't think we actually believe that poor black kids can achieve the same. And so I think that we believe mm. what we're seeing is just a manifestation of who they are. Mm. Right. Lisa, go ahead so and speak to So there me. were a lot of challenges when we were reporting failure factories mm. and all pale in comparison to uh, following Nicole Hannah-Jones on a panel, because I just want to <laughs> say ditto to everything that she <laughs> says, but I think I'm expected to talk a little bit more. Um, so uh, to answer the question, the ethics of the topics covered relative to racial disparities and choosing whether to cover um, segregation or not, uh, we came at this as investigative reporters, and as investigative reporters, we want to be able to shine a light on any situation in which people in power are getting one over on a marginalized group, whether that's race, um, sex, religion, um, disability. Um, so for us, it, it was pretty clear once that was revealed to be the issue, we weren't gonna shy away from that. We were gonna report on it and hold people who weren't making the right decisions accountable for that. Um, that said, you know, uh, this vote happened in 2007 and it was pretty obvious what was happening um, within a year or two when you talk to the families and the teachers. Uh, so we, we started looking at this in 2014, 15, so there were several years where we weren't covering this. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that I think is uh, important. Um, we are one of hundreds of newsrooms across the country that don't have as much diversity as we should. Um, and when that happens, uh, I, I think you just need to be hyper aware that the reality experienced by your fellow reporters and editors and, and what your initial perception mm -hmm. might be isn't necessarily true. Mm -hmm. um, we have so many editors and reporters at the Times uh, who had kids in the schools and never took a deeper dive on this. And one mm -hmm. of the things that strikes me is, uh, for example, um, there was an editor who, our fifth story was about fundamental schools, which are um, lottery schools in Pinellas, they're public, um, anyone can get into them. Uh, and he had his children go through the fundamental schools. And we were writing about how um, black children had a uh, much more difficult time getting access to these schools for a variety of reasons. Um, there's preference given to teachers' children. Most teachers are white. Sibling preference uh, perpetuates that in the location of the schools. I mean, they move them out of black neighborhoods into white neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we encountered some resistance. Um, and I think one of the things that we heard was, uh, well, my daughter went there and there were, I mean, it was diverse. And what he means by that, mm -hmm. and he means well, is that there was a black child in her mm -hmm. class. Right. Uh, not that there were enough black children, <laughs> or that black children weren't being counseled out over behavior issues. So um, I, I, think, I think there are a lot, it, it seems so basic, but one of the main things that you can take away from today is just to be aware of, of the biases that may exist from very well-intentioned people. Um, so, uh, and that's something that we heard in the community as well. Um, people were aware that black children weren't doing as well as they should, but they were kind of throwing up their hands and saying this is a problem everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, or, I don't know what's going on. Um, my favorite was, there's something in the water in Pinellas, <laughs> mm. which is like, <laughs> I mean, come on. So, uh, 
The last thing I'll say on this is that um, we as journalists are, of course, objective, but um, we're, when you do investigative reporting like this, you're not impartial. You see where your results, your reporting leads you through the data um, and through what you found through your own research and your interviews, and you draw conclusions. And the conclusion that we drew is that this school board abandoned integration, failed to deliver on the promises it made, and essentially ruined five schools, giving these children you know, no chance at, a, at academic success. So um, for, for us to not cover that, I think, would have been a, a huge failure on our part. Sue? Yeah, ditto, ditto, ditto. <laughs> and I, I find it interesting, so Nicole had declared that she doesn't believe in objectivity and Lisa's all about objectivity, and I want to address that um, because uh, I have a, a piece coming out with um, Dr. Culver about, um, it's called When White Reporters Cover Race, mm -hmm. and it looks at objectivity and particularly mm -hmm. how it has created sort of um, this distrust between communities of color and media. Um, and we call for a, ch a change in thinking about objectivity. So I think part of the problem is when, in my research, seeing how objectivity was practiced as this very passive sort of he said, she said, and if I quote the report, and if I quote the superintendent, and I get the activists of color, like, there, I'm all objective. And so what, what we're calling for, rather, is a more kind of a relational, active, interpretive notion of what objectivity means, mm -hmm. which is that, um, that we have to go into these communities, reporting from the communities, um, and really developing the trust that's necessary that we've already done, right, in the power structures. We've already developed that trust. And there's this real kind of nice reciprocal power indexing that a lot of people have already um, researched. But we need to do that work in the communities of color as well. Um, and then, then we really will be more objective, right? We really will have gotten all of the sides and understand all of the nuances of these really complicated issues. So I'll just, I'll just end there. Could I just, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say, I'd, I like, just, I'd like the others to speak to objectivity for a second too. Yeah. I mean, I think I've said what I have to say on objectivity. I just don't, I don't, I just don't believe, I don't believe it's possible unless it's a subject that I know absolutely nothing about and that's only because I don't know enough to have yet formed an opinion. Um, I think that you, don't you love how like, people say they've said all they have to say and then they keep talking? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, I do believe in, in I, not making up your mind. Clearly, I mean, mm. when I went in to write about resegregation, I knew it was happening. I didn't know why. The data showed it was happening. So it wasn't an opinion I was, I was looking into. It was facts and then trying to figure out why. I also had to look at all the data to see, is integration really the best thing? Is that true? Um, and so read literally dozens and dozens of studies and was able to draw a conclusion based on that. But I was not objective in that I hadn't had my own experiences. I hadn't seen enough of what happens in segregated black schools to believe um, that I didn't have a feeling about that. The thing I actually wanted to talk just quickly about is this, this uh, notion of intent, which you kind of talk about. I think when it comes to writing about race, that is a thing that we get so caught up in mm -hmm. that I think is, para is paralyzing. Yeah. Is we don't want to call anything um, racist or racially unjust mm -hmm. or call out the bias unless we can show what was in that person's heart like did they resegregate those kids because they hate black kids mm -hmm. i don't care i don't think it matters i think what matters is they did it and they knew what the consequences of the action was going to be and they did it anyway and i think as journalists as writers as people we need to stop always worrying about intent because really what we want to do is is we want someone to like free us of our own guilt when mm -hmm. we are progressive white people living in a highly segregated community, sending our kids to the few integrated schools in a very segregated school district. We need to feel okay about that because our intentions are good. As journalists, I don't care. And, and the thing that I always say is, if like ExxonMobil has a spill in the Gulf, we don't care whether the president of ExxonMobil likes ducks or hates ducks. We only care that he should have done something to, he could have done something to prevent this spill and he did it. And I think when it comes to race, we need to know the intent and we, and we need to stop doing that and just look at the actions and the accountability. Mm -hmm. Said, Lisa, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I don't know if Linda Lerner, the like 25 year school board chairwoman, I mean, I know, I, I don't think she sits there and thinks I hate black children. But I think by uh, not caring, by putting it on the back burner, back burner, by neglecting, I mean, 
it's like any dating advice you've ever received. Like, look at someone's actions, not what they say. Right. It's what they do that matters. Um, so I agree completely. I also think, um, as far as objectivity, I think we're saying the same thing, but in different terms. When mm -hmm. I talk about being objective, but not impartial, yeah. is that you go into a situation, um, you don't have a predetermined idea of who's at fault or what the story is. Um, you use your mind. And when I say not impartial, I mean, we do take sides. We do draw conclusions that integration is better than segregation that uh, people didn't do what they were gonna say they were gonna do, that these kids are failing. Um, so I, I think there is a consensus on that. Mm -hmm. Given the time, I'd like to make sure that we offer a chance for the audience to, to get their questions heard. So, um, so I'm gonna turn it over to the audience and then uh, we do, I do have some final, final follow-up questions if, uh, if the audience questions run out. I mean, I don't think it runs at odds at all. I think the burden of integration has always been on black children mm -hmm. to go the furthest distance, to have to leave their neighborhood schools behind, to go into schools where they're not necessarily wanted. I, as a child who was bused into a very white school, can tell you socially and emotionally, it was very, very difficult for me. Um, I think when we're talking, when I talk about integration, I, I talk about integration as justice and equality, and that if we have, if we could manage to actually produce all black schools that were treated equally, that would be one thing, but we haven't. So I think what you saw, and I've written about this, even um, the resegregation that happened in Tuscaloosa was condoned by the black elite in that town who got tired of chasing white kids um, who didn't, whose parents did not want their kids in the school with black children, and who had been very worn out by, by the burden that was placed on black children and so felt maybe if they promise to treat these schools right, maybe this is the right thing. I think that tension is, is there. I think what's important, particularly in progressive communities, is for the white people in the communities to examine what it is that makes, even in a place where people ostensibly say they believe mm -hmm. in integration and educational equality, why there's such gaping disparities up north. Frankly, the South has done way better um, on this issue, partially because the South had to. Um, but also because we don't have the intense residential segregation, which keeps many white folks in the North from even having intimate relationships with black people. So I, I, don't, I don't know if that's a tension. There's, there, there's never been a time where black children, whether they're in all black schools, integrated schools, heavily white schools, have received an equal education. And I think we're still trying to live up to that, that standard and that many black folks are, are tired of trying it in white schools. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't come down, I don't come down either way about in, in support of the charter school or not in the book. I was really more interested in the conversation around it because we didn't have that conversation, right? Instead, we had a conversation about whether it was legal or not because of the um, union contracts. We had a conversation about whether um, the district could afford it. We had a conversation about, um, and a lot of veiled euphemisms about you know, the majority um, school population versus the students of color. And, and, that, and those conversations needed to happen as well. But the problem was is that we had a lot of all white reporters who were nervous about talking about race um, in a very explicit way about what this, um, the, the very proposal meant um, to the communities of color and why it was necessary, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't have that sort of conversation about the historical opportunity gaps um, in the education system in Madison, and we needed to have that conversation in a much more, in a much deeper way um, than we were able to have. And so I was curious about why that was. And when we talked to the reporters, they they were very um, they were very cognizant of their whiteness um, when they would talk to people about this issue. They didn't, they didn't really want to bring up race, and, and for a lot of reasons, in part because they feel like they didn't have the space in the newspaper particularly to um, get at some of those issues. They thought that that would need, you know, they need to write a book about it, for example. Um, they also felt like um, they couldn't 
um, build the trust that they needed in the two hours that they had, were given to do the story. Um, and so that says something about you know, the lack of trust building that had happened over the years prior. Um, so the, we asked, I also had somebody tell me that, um, that they kind of stayed at the official level and only wrote about the, the school according because of school hearing, after the school hearings, for example. Um, and didn't really do like kind of a big think piece because um, it was sort of a sticky topic. And to, to get into it, um, th they were just, they were kind of nervous that they would um, ruin any progress that had already been made. That's another quote from, from the report. So, so I, I was curious that why we didn't have that conversation about whether it was segregation or, or whether it was actually you know, trying to resolve some of the, the historic disparities that have been plaguing this school district for years. We just, we have to get away from it. There's nothing more complicated or complex in this country that, than race. Right. We have to get away from thinking that things are black or white, that it's either or. It's never either or. I mean, ultimately what Brown v. Board was about was black folks wanting an equal education. It wasn't about their desperate desire to have their kids in white schools. It was about understanding what proximity to whiteness would mean for your chances of getting equality. And I think we need to stop thinking that there's only one way, one answer, one way to look at this. There, there are all of these various tensions. I would have loved to not have to ride a bus two hours a day to go to get a quality ed education. I would have loved to have been one of those kids who could walk to my neighborhood school. Unfortunately, I could not if I wanted a good education. So I think black Americans don't want anything different for their kids than white Americans. We just have come to this country under very different circumstances. Over here. Thank you, Dr. Jack. I, I appreciate the conversation about objectivity, which has always been a murky term. <laughs> murky term yes. for me. Um, uh, so thank you for that conversation. Uh, but I'd like to turn it a little bit to Nicole's favorite term, fairness, which is also kind of murky. Uh, we all think we know what it means, and none of us does a very good job of explaining it. So I wondered if the panel would tackle that, uh, maybe with an example or two of what they mean by that term. I'm not going first this time. Lisa? Um, Lisa, why don't you start? Yes. Well, as far as just fairness on a, on a broad level or in, in something specific? Sure. Well, what pops into my mind when you say that is, um, what you were saying about how we all agree that murder is bad. Uh, when you're writing a story about murder, you're not giving equal space to a conspiracy theorist who's saying that murder is actually great and it's um, helping population control, so, you know, yay murder. Uh, in, in our reporting, um, you know, we were mindful of that as well. Uh, when we felt like um, we had good ground to stand on, then we can make our case, and then we had drawn our conclusions. We, we weren't like uh, searching the earth for, for someone to say, oh no, it's actually great because now, you know, they're not disrupting our white kids or our white kids are doing, you know, whatever now. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think it's more fair to, to tell the truth um, than to try to have every angle represented. I would say, I mean, in some ways it's true, it's like porn, right? You know it when you see it or whatever. Yeah. Well, not porn. What is <laughs> Maybe it's porn. <laughs> I think everybody uh, knows what porn is. That's not <laughs> exactly what I was trying to say, obscenity. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, like for me, fairness is, people know what, people, I have, I have given people a chance to respond to everything that's going to be in the article. Um, they may not ultimately agree with the conclusions, uh, I, I know that some of the folks who resegregated the schools in Tuscaloosa did not like the conclusions of the story, but they couldn't argue with the facts. There was nothing that they could ask for to be corrected, and they weren't surprised by anything. Um, if people don't want to comment on a story, uh, I make several attempts, and then I send an email and lay out all of my questions. And there's never a point where anyone can open a story or look at a story and be surprised by that. To me, that's fairness. Were the facts right? Did you have a chance to respond to everything? Were there no surprises? And that's the best that I can do. We had the same experience. We, um, 
met with uh, the school board and the school administration multiple times, told them what we were looking at from the outset, uh, and, and called them after it ran to get their reaction. Um, you, you really don't want to blindside anyone for multiple reasons. One, you may catch an error that you didn't know you had. You want to give people a chance to respond. Um, and, and we had the same experience in that, you know, the school board doesn't like our story, but there's nothing that they can point to that's wrong or, or not fair or accurate. So um, that, that was important. And I would just add, um, I think fairness also in, incorporates contextualization and making sure that when we have these stories, say a proposal happens and, and, you, and you write that story, that you unpack some of the ways that school practices um, have created the problems that the proposal needs to solve, like the demographics of teachers, the ways in which testing privileges white students, the discipline policies that disproportionately affect students of color, and you know some of, the, some of these um, histories, I don't think often get into those stories, and you really don't need a ton of room, like even just a paragraph that, that points to some of the, um, the, the structural um, problematics that have been happening, I think, incorporates into that fairness, that idea of like we're going to give the whole story and really give the whole story. I do think that the, 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 the way that you ensure fairness is gut check, if, if there's something in your story that you're afraid to read back mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the source, then you need to wonder why. And a lot of people don't like to read back things, but to me, like if there's something that I'm feeling uncomfortable actually saying to the person that I'm writing about, then I'm probably not being fair someplace and there's something I need to, I need to think about with that wording. So that's my practice is um, I, I do read back passages, particularly ones that I'm concerned about and um, it's, it's a good way of checking yourself. You should not be uncomfortable with the person, being face to face with the person and, and what you're writing about them. Okay, question over, oh here first and then oh. over there. Yeah, yeah I just, it's interesting uh, that we just looked on uh, MSNBC this morning and all the male presidential candidates were in color and Hillary was in black and white. And uh, uh, I noticed the panel up there, uh, there's one in black and white and the other three in color. Uh, the three white women are in color and the black woman is in black and white. And also I knew it was the racist. most significant speaker, <laughs> like Hillary is maybe the most significant presidential candidate. Uh, I, I, I just wonder if there's something there or making something out of nothing. I just or, submitted or, a black and can, white mug you, shot, that's it. <laughs> or can I have you a black background because I'm can, evil. Can you broaden, <laughs> broaden the topic to journal, journalistic photos in general and, 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 uh, uh, and make some comments on that? Journalistic photos, and maybe we'll relate it back to education. So, um, journalistic photos related to education and race reporting. Um, I'm not sure what the question. Is. So, I, I think the question is, what are the, what are the ethics of, of thinking about the the photos and the pictures that are used um, relative to reporting of race and about education? We were um, we dealt with a lot of children for our project, and we you know, always had permission from their parents to speak to them, um, wanted to make sure they were as clear as possible about what was going on without um, coloring the answers that, uh, that we'd get from them. But to get to the photo point, we had a couple um, times where we were making careful decisions about what photos to use. Um, that goes back to the, the stock image question. You know, like if we have a headline that says lessons in fear, we don't want to run a photo we took at Lakewood Elementary of like, five black children walking because we, we don't know exactly what's going on in their minds or it, it, what we're imparting on these children. Uh, so we actually um, had this like last minute decision to pull a photo for that reason. You know, we just didn't want to, to do that and found a different frame where we knew the child in the center of that photo and we had talked to her and her father and we knew that she was afraid to go to school. Her, father thought, you know, something bad could happen to her. So uh, I think more broadly, though, you want to be careful how, um, if, if you're perpetuating stereotypes with your photos as well, and, and you might want to speak to this. Uh, but I, I think it's always, in the, sorry, I'm, I'm not saying this well, but 
in, in the sense that uh, what you were saying earlier about white people being treated as fuller humans, um, if, if all your pictures are mm -hmm. of the black children looking angry or um, you know something bad happening to them, some of the best art we had was of like this kid who had just lost his two front teeth and he's like having a great time and he's riding his bicycle with his Ninja Turtle helmet. Um, I think you're doing a better service when you're representing the, the full human in the photos. Anyone else want to speak to that? It's, okay. All right, we're going to go over here. Thank you. Um, this is kind of tied back into the panel before about language also, but I've heard the word a lot more and I hear it a lot more when we talk about education, particularly here in Madison and Dane County, the word progressive. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. As journalists, are you doing a disservice by describing Madison as something that's progressive, but we have something like the Race to Equity report that has come out that has clearly shown we're not progressive. So by continuing to frame this area, wherever you are maybe, and you're calling these cities progressive, but there are clear facts and <laughs> figures that show we're not progressive. And it always happens, I feel, very much in education and where we all know of our educational <clears throat> debt to students of color. As journalists, should we be mindful of how we refer to cities, especially when we use that term progressive? When many people of color do not feel that way about the city that you're describing. What a great point. And that's mm -hmm. something that I uh, explore in my book, um, particularly the, the word progressive. And so here in Madison, we have Progressive Dane, which is actually a progressive party, um, one of the few in the country that's, uh, that's, that's still living. Um, and, and so we need to, we need to interrogate that, um, particularly when, when a reporter finds themselves using that. And mm -hmm. I think that that's a discussion that, um, that has to be having in newsrooms. What a wonderful point. I mean, in some ways I felt it's a rhetorical question, right? But um, <laughs> I actually think that, I, I think the, in reporting on racial inequality, it actually is a word that has great utility because I'm working on a piece right now about a school integration battle in Brooklyn, which is, you know, considered the most progressive borough of one of the world's most progressive cities in one of the bluest states. And the utility there is for me to point out that irony mm -hmm. of people who espouse these beliefs but in practice live very different lives, particularly when it comes to where they're choosing to put their children. So, and as someone who studies race, I see zero contradiction whatsoever in being progressive on many issues, even being progressive on race issues, and acting in ways con contrary. I mean, that's, that's the American dilemma, right? That's what Gunnar Mur Murdahl, when he came down south, called the American dilemma. So I think it's how we use it. Now, commonly how it's used is to you know, show some kind of shock that even in this city, mm. we would have these things. I don't use it that way because I'm not shocked by, I mean, like I said, the segregation in both housing and schools is far worse. Milwaukee, most segregated in the country. Um, so I, I think it's, it's how are you using the word and is it actually informing or, or not? But, it, but it's informative though because it goes to identity. So if you call yourself Clearly. progressive, you feel yourself to be really progressive. And so um, I, th I think that's something that we need to be aware of you know, as reporters in terms of like, it's not just a term that people throw around lightly. It's something that they you know, feel is a part of them. I'm going to ask another question that's related to this, um, sort of the other side of it when we're using terms like progressive. I'm wondering, um, in writing about race and education, if there's ways in which communities of color are pathologized or made to seem deficient, and, uh, and if so, how might that be avoided? Um, this absolutely happens. Um, and it's something that I, I know we were hyper vigilant about when we were uh, telling our stories. Mm -hmm. um, we went to great lengths to make sure um, some of the problems we highlighted, like bad behavior in the schools, was not inherent in a, a people or population, but um, decisions made to cluster together, um, confluences of poverty. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, I think it absolutely happens. Is there a way to avoid it? And I, well, we did. We did a lot of legwork, uh, we did uh, kind of a systemic, uh, systematic uh, analysis of lots of factors that people tend to blame um, 
Because so much of the problem in Pinellas, no one was really looking at what the people in power were doing. They were just kind of like side-eyeing the community. Um, so we did a big analysis. Uh, we looked at factors using census data, like um, education level in the home, sing number of single parent ho households, um, you know, income level, and found that Pinellas was average or doing better for its black population than um, the black populations across Florida. So we were able to um, strike down a lot of the arguments that people were going to make uh, right off the bat. Um, and, and we knew that as education reporters, we know what kind of voicemails and emails we get, uh, what, what the criticisms were gonna be. So we had, um, I, I think that was a good approach that we did. Reporting, I mean, that, <laughs> that's the amazing thing about reporting, mm -hmm. is um, reporting defies stereotypes if you do it right. Mm -hmm. What was so great about the investigation that you guys did was exactly that, it was that you showed if it was in fact an inherent flaw in black folks, then you would have found the exact same things in every other school that served that demographic. And we know that that's not true, that there are high poverty black schools that do reasonably well, and there are others that do terribly, and the factor is, are not the kids in the schools and it's not the parents. So I think reporting is critical. I also think, I mean, think about language. Someone, I think, even asked a question about the black community, which is non-existent. Mm -hmm. we, there, are, there are black communities. There are physical places of communities of black people, but there is no monolithic black mm -hmm. community. We never talk about a white community. And so what that does necessarily then is every time we write about someone who is black, we are then saying we are writing about this one community and its pathology. So I think mm -hmm. our language is important. Our language understands that there are black people like me who have two degrees, who are very high income, who are very educated, and there are other black people who have less income, who are living in higher poverty, and we are all black. Some of us are not more black than others, but I don't think we tend to write about black people, Latinos, I mean, just that, that, that community is like one of my biggest pet peeves because it, it's, it's diminishing and it allows for this kind of broad uh, stereotyping. Beyond the data in our reporting, we talked to hundreds of people. I mean, this was a really um, long project. Uh, it, probably at least 100 to 150 parents in these schools. And it goes to what you were saying earlier. I mean, I didn't talk to a single one who was like, I don't care about my kid's education. Mm -hmm. Most of them were very angry about what was going on in the schools and like very happy that someone was paying attention to the issue. Um, and, and very educated on what was going wrong. I mean, we got great ideas for where to lead our stories just from talking to parents and, and grandparents and uncles and aunts. So I think that's another form mm -hmm. of, um, of kind of breaking down the stereotypes that people are gonna hit you with is, is here's person after person after person who's having this experience and telling you it's, it's not what you think it is. Mm -hmm. It's not that they don't care. Absolutely. It should be obvious, but. Right, it should be. Yeah, was, you know. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other questions from the audience? There's one right oh, there. Right over here. So what is your perception of the support of media management for reporters to be more knowledgeable about the issues of race, uh, ethnicity? And, and I understand that I'm talking to people who know what they're talking about. but. Is management actually recognizing that we need more education along these lines? And we, by that, I mean journalists? Um, I think if you're, I think your question is how management can, can make its reporters uh, more versed in this. Um, I, I think uh, if I were an editor or a manager, I would encourage more reporters to actually go out and meet the people that they're writing about, um, go out in the different communities, um, talk to people. Uh, I think a lot of times when um, reporting on race goes wrong, it's because it's all reliant on um, academics or data, and it, it's not, um, so you'll, you'll have a much more accurate uh, picture of what's going on if you actually talk to people. And I think some <laughs> people are afraid to, you know? I don't know if it's like deadline pressure or people are uncomfortable talking to people who don't look like them, um, but it's, it's kind of silly, and, and that's something that I would encourage as a manager. 
I, I just want to mention, though, we, we talked to a lot of um, managers in the course of the book, and very, very few of them um, allowed for any diversity training, for example, in their workshop, mm -hmm. in their um, newsrooms. And in those that did, it was, it was literally like a couple hours on one day um, over the course. And so one of the things I call for is not just kind of widespread diversity training, whatever that means, because it, it basically means get out into the neighborhoods, right? Um, but it also means um, sort of uh, privilege training, the idea of like looking at your, at your own um, privileges as an individual reporter and understanding how that might bias your work. And I think that that is so fundamental to any reporter to understand the stance that you bring to the story. Um, and I didn't see that anywhere. And it really has to come from the top. It has to come from um, the editors to make time into the schedule in the newsroom, to get rid of one of those meetings that they have and, and do you know, some, real, some real introspection on that. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think that uh, newsrooms are doing a very good job of encouraging uh, real reporting in this area or hiring um, in ways that I think will fundamental, fundamentally shift the reporting in this area. What I do hope, though, is you look at um, the major awards this year, and so many of them were around real investigative reporting into racial inequality, and I hope that that, that that seeing that this reporting actually is the highest caliber of reporting, but also among the highest calling of reporters may, may change the way that newsrooms are thinking about the need to cover this. Yeah, I'm just gonna add that J schools, journalism schools across the country also have to be doing this work and we're not, and we're just, we're, we're, some of us are working on it, but it's, um, it's something that we need to do at the entry level. Okay. So we are almost at the time for lunch. Um, but I'd like to offer the panelists one last opportunity. If there was something that you had wished to say um, earlier on the panel that you didn't get to, this would be a great time. Okay. All right. Please join me in, um, in, in thanking them.